Hello, this is Rich Eisenberg. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Inorganic Chemistry. As part of our 50th anniversary year, we are bringing to you interviews with leaders in our field. Today, it's a distinct pleasure to have as our interviewee, Professor Joan Valentine from UCLA. Joan is the Editor-in-Chief of Accounts of Chemical Research and is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Joan was a winner of the Alfred Bader Award for Bioinorganic Chemistry and also uh, a medalist for the John C. Baylor Medal from the University of Illinois. Welcome, Joan. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. Joan, let's, let's tell our, our viewers uh, how you started uh, the early years before, uh, before you became professionally involved in chemistry, uh, your education as a child, how you developed your interest in science. Um, well, actually, I wasn't all that interested in science. You know, Sputnik happened. I'm, a, I'm one of those Sputnik children, but um, I mean, a little bit too old to have been inspired. But so the science wasn't emphasized in school, but both of my uh, parents were physicians and they, um, uh, so I was going to be a doctor. I was going to be a medical doctor. And so um, that was my goal and I was quite set on it. Um, actually, all the way until I was a junior year undergraduate um, in college, um, I was, uh, um, I was interested in the little bit of science I had, and I had a chemistry set, but um, it never occurred to me that I would do chemistry. But then when I was in college, um, I was taking analytical chemistry from uh, George Fleck, a professor at Smith College, and he, um, I finished all this, the analytical chemistry early, and so he said, Oh, well, I'll give you a research project. This was also before undergraduate research, right? So we weren't routinely doing undergraduate research. And so he gave me a problem, and I said, you mean nobody knows the answer to this? And, uh, and he said, that's right. And that, that, that changed my life. You mean I can solve problems where people don't know the answers? <laughs> And, uh, you know, it was in organic chemistry, and that's what started it. And, of course, then there are the colors and, and so on. I was hooked. But it's the role of a, of a teacher who uh, <laughs> asked, a, asked a question. And uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, the, the graduate work that you did and uh, what you studied and uh, uh, where you did it. <laughs> so I got my, as I said, I got my undergraduate degree at Smith College and then I went um, to Princeton University for my PhD in inorganic chemistry and there, so my entire career I've worked on metals and O2 um, and uh, it all started when I was actually a graduate student when I was doing inorganic photochemistry on um, cobalt dioxygen complexes and uh, um, I got very interested in how metals bind O2. And um, during the period that I was at Princeton, I actually spent some time at Stanford also in Jim Coleman's lab and worked on some other metal O2 complexes. And uh, I've worked on metal O2 complexes and related things my entire career, actually, since then. So those are actually uh, some of the important threads and themes that will run through all of your research. Yes, that's true. <laughs> now, I know that uh, one part of it relates to superoxide and superoxide dismutase. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you pick that particular mm -hmm. problem or, and uh, focus on it? Okay, well, the um, Tom Spira doesn't remember this story, but actually I was, uh, um, but it's true. The, I was an assistant, starting assistant professor at Rutgers University, and I, um, I had been working on metal O2 complexes, but when I started, there weren't very many, um, but, but by, you know, by the time I was starting as an assistant professor, I mean, when I started as a graduate student, 
everybody was doing this. And I was talking on the phone to Tom Spiro, and I said, Tom, if I work on metal O2 complexes as a, as a assistant professor, everybody's doing that. And he said, you know, I just got back from a really interesting Gordon, conference, Gordon research conference, and this guy called Erwin Friedovich talked about an enzyme that called superoxide dismutase, and I had never heard of it before. It was the, I mean, it was really, literally, um, had just been discovered by Friedovich. And so then I thought about, hmm, O2 minus. I'd already worked on O2 minus complexes of cobalt. I had no idea it was biologically relevant, but that's what, that's what started me. Now, the superoxide dismutase relates in some ways to ALS. Uh, you've been working on that. Uh, can you explain to our, our viewers first about ALS and how the superoxide dismutase work ties into that? Okay, so um, actually in the beginning in, of my academic career, I was doing inorganic, I mean, I was trained as an inorganic chemist, not a biochemist, um, and I was doing inorganic chemistry of metals and superoxide and um, hoping that the chemistry would be biologically relevant. Um, but then I had a, a graduate student who signed up to work with me at Rutgers and uh, named Mike Pantoliano, and he was a biochemistry graduate student. And I told him, I don't know any biochemistry. And he said, I don't, it doesn't matter, I want to work for you <laughs> anyway. And I said, okay, but we're not going to work on biochemistry. And he said, okay. And then he proceeded to isolate copper zinc superoxide dismutase. And he said it was just for fun, he wouldn't work on it. But then he showed it to me, and there it was, and it was blue-green and I said, oh, that's just a molecule. <laughs> it's a coordination complex, and we started working with it um, then. So then we worked for many years on copper zinc superoxide dismutase. Um, the, the bovine, the, the isolated from cows, um, and when I moved to UCLA in 1980, um, I, was, I was looking for a way to to expand. We actually um, the the technology had been developed to um, site directed mutagenesis, and so that we could actually make mutant forms of um, copper zinc superoxide dismutase. So then we were doing protein redesign, and um, again inorganic coordination chemistry was what it was about. But we, um, right in 1993, there was the announcement that mutations in the gene coding for copper zinc superoxide dismutase caused ALS. ALS is Lou Gehrig's disease. I knew very little about it at the time. Um, but um, this was extraordinary. Nobody had ever linked to these, but we were in a very good position because we were already doing mutagenesis. So we could actually make the mutant proteins and study them, and that's what transitioned us into the ALS field. I'm going to go back a little bit and ask you to explain a little bit of why superoxide dismutase is important uh, in terms of our being able to, to live. <laughs> so. The, as I said, Erwin Friedrich discovered not only the first superoxide dismutase, but several others. Um, and it was a real turning point in our understanding of um, essentially living in air. How do you live in air? Um, oxygen is a very, very oxidizing molecule, um, but it really hadn't been appreciated um, in biology how um, damaging O2 is. Um, and it's really with the discovery that there was um, an enzyme that lowered the levels of superoxide. Uh, uh, superoxide is just O2 minus, one, one more electron, um, in vivo that people realized, you know, started really paying attention to antioxidant enzymes and the um, 
the constant barrage of oxidative stress that we live with when we are um, uh, when we live in air, and uh, so this the whole area of oxidative stress and the oxidative stress related illnesses and um, aging um, really really um, developed um, around that time, and so although we were doing the inorganic side of it, um, we were always very aware of the, um, of our rela the relationship to oxidative stress and health. Now, the, the term oxidative stress is another uh, one that uh, actually, it's another area that you do work on, yes. but obviously overlapped with the, the superoxide mm -hmm. uh, dismutase chemistry. Describe to us a little bit about uh, oxidative stress and, and what that means uh, chemically and f maybe physiologically uh, mm -hmm. for us. So um, that's actually been a big focus of our work, part, I guess because I came into the field really as a chemist and um, people talked, started talking in the field about the chemistry of reactive oxygen species, ROS. Mm -hmm. And people would talk about it as though ROS was a molecule. And ROS actually represented superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical, um, other related peroxy radicals, and so on. And of course, as a chemist, um, I was very aware that these have dis very distinctive chemistries. And so one of the things that, that we worked on um, quite early on superoxide chemistry was um, finding out what is the chemical reactivity of superoxide, how does it differ from hydrogen peroxide, and then what are the vulnerable targets in vivo. And then I ended up actually working with some in vivo systems in yeast where we made mutants that had no superoxide dismutase, and then we looked at what was wrong with them and to try and deduce what, um, what the problems were. And the really interesting thing that happened from that is that they had problem, it was, it was all about metals, problems with iron metabolism, differences with levels of manganese. Um, so the whole the whole issue of oxidative stress and superoxide has always kept me very metallocentric. <laughs> uh, it's actually one of the things that I will, when I'm teaching uh, even freshman chemistry, mm -hmm. and we talk about molecular orbitals for O2 and the fact that mm -hmm. molecular oxygen is a triplet right. and that keeps us all from burning up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's very important yes. uh, and then the species that form upon reduction, partial reduction, those are the ones that can get you. Right, that's right, that's right. And they each have distinctive chemistries and uh, um, it's, I, I think it's pretty interesting. It really wasn't appreciated back in the early days. And so it's been a very interesting field to be in over these years. What would you describe as your, let's say, proudest research accomplishment and uh, perhaps your most important one. I, it, it's, sometimes they're different, sometimes they're the same. Um, I think, let's see, the one, the, okay, so the ones I was most excited about are not the ones I was necessarily the proudest of, but um, I can tell you all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, go ahead, continue on. <laughs> um, Okay, so the one I was most excited about was, and I was, um, when I realized that a um, coordination complex we had made by reacting an iron two porphyrin with superoxide, and it made, it reacted one to one and made an adduct, and but it had, it, I knew it was, I knew it was iron three but it had a rhombic EPR spectrum, and this made no sense because an iron-3 porphyrin should not have had a rhombic um, uh, EPR spectrum. And um, this was really bothering me, and I actually remember I was at an opera, at the Metropolitan Opera, when I realized that the 
um, coordinate that it was binding sideways. And that was why it had a rhombic EPR spectrum. And I think that's the most exciting thing. <laughs> Um, the thing I'm most proud of probably is um, having, um, or actually proudest of my students for doing, they really decided they were going to make a whole, the, a whole large range of mutant superoxide dismutases, the different ones that cause ALS. And um, this was a huge amount of work on their part, not on my part, <laughs> but on their part. Um, but the result of this is that we had these different mutant SODs that, that to, and we could study their properties, and we were able to um, group them into some distinctive classes where the properties differed, and that hadn't been realized um, before that time um, uh, in the ALS field. And so I think I, I think that's what I'm proudest of. Now, you actually have um, bridged biological chemistry and inorganic chemistry and have been a leader in bio-inorganic chemistry for years. Um, what advice would you have for your students and, and others and, and uh, new faculty in terms of communicating uh, their science, how to frame their science, and to whom to communicate their science? how to communicate their science. Um, well, how you communicate your science is, is a real challenge for a young person. I mean, I remember people telling me, people who were my mentors telling me, ooh, that's really exciting. You've got to publish a series of communications about that. And um, I had a really hard time doing that because I like to know the answer to a problem. On the other hand, I would tend to wait too long to publish stories. And so, um, you know, I had to find some way, some compromise where I, f I felt that every paper I published was significant, but I wasn't waiting forever <laughs> to publish things. And also, I think publication, there, uh, when you publish a series of papers on a topic, the topic is evolving, and you have to realize that you're going to understand it better in the later papers than you do in the beginning, and that's okay, because that's what scientific publication is. I mean, it's like an ongoing conversation with the scientific community. And so you want to be sure that your data are right, and, you, and you're interpreting to the highest level you can, and you need to talk to lots of people and get their feedback before you actually submit a paper so that you can sort of pre-referee it. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, and then just get your story out there and uh, do it in good journals like Inorganic Chemistry. We're not pushing for a, an endorsement yet, but we'll be back to that, yeah. Um, but also you have you have these different audiences. You have mm -hmm. the more biologically attuned scientists mm -hmm. and the, the, perhaps the coordination chemists and the, the, mm -hmm. the uh, physically uh, oriented uh, inorganic chemists. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to uh, make both groups of people mm -hmm. well aware of what it is because they're the ones that can have the perspective uh, uh, on this kind of problem. Right, right. And so I think people like me have had to um, be sure that we are publishing in a range of journals so that we are talking to the audiences that are interested because, I mean, for me, since I got into this biomedical stuff, um, you know, I really have, I, I mean, people in the ALS field are not going to read, unfortunately, in organic chemistry. Although they may be starting to now, I don't, um, but you know, in the old days. So, um, so you try and publish in a range of journals and, and to stay, and to make yourself part of um, the different communities. So I've always identified myself as an inorganic coordination chemist. But um, I'm comfortable now with the neurochemists um, and uh, um, people in neuromedicine um, and, uh, and biochemistry and so on. Um, 
but um, you need to publish in a diverse range of journals and be sure that you explain your work to a wide range of people. Can you also accomplish that in part by going to conferences, judiciously choosing which mm -hmm. conferences, and actually starting to make connections across disciplinary boundaries, I'll put that in quotes, mm -hmm. by doing that? By yeah, no, that. It's, that's very important. And uh, it does, it did feel very strange the first time I went to a very biological meeting that had no inorganic component to it. Um, but, uh, you know, I felt sort of lonely. Where are my friends, my inorganic friends? Um, but, you know, you meet people, you talk to people, and all, the other thing is you go to those communities and people are really interested. You know, metals are so important in biology, and so many people who work in biology areas don't really have a deep understanding, but they know that the metals are important, and they have all kinds of questions, and, and you become an instant expert. It's, it's quite gratifying, actually. So that's actually, that's a very, very good way to do it. And you start to make those connections, mm -hmm. and then you actually feel more and more comfortable with that right. community. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and you make connections. So I have good friends that are, you know, people that I um, many years ago timidly approached at a meeting and we made a connection and uh, it, we've ended up collaborating. You know, the things you never would have expected. It's it's very important to talk to people in a broad range of fields and make connections. Okay. John, let's, let's turn our attention to the funding situation, which is really important for, uh, for all of us, because it's the only way we get our science done. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the funding situation you encountered when you started, and how it compares with the funding situation today for young, young investigators. Um, well, so when I started, um, I don't think I was, I wasn't very sophisticated about, I, I just, you know, I just wrote a grant and sent it in. Um, but in retrospect, I realized that I really had a much easier time than young people are, are having now um, because uh, I didn't have to resubmit a grant very often. Um, and, uh, you know, first I got NSF funding and then I got NIH funding and then I got another NIH grant. And so it, it grew and um, I sat on study section and, uh, you know, everything seemed very fair. But I was actually on the NIH study section at a time when things got much harder. And then all of a sudden I saw young people who were submitting over and over and over again. And I just I felt very bad for them. Um, and, uh, but the fact is that the people who did the good science and were persistent, they did get funded. But it, it is different. Um, actually at one point, um, uh, the person who mentored me about applying for grants and, and uh, how to choose a research topic and so on was actually Fred Hawthorne. So I went to Fred um, before I submitted for my second NIH grant. I went to Fred, I said, I don't have enough money. I, how, I don't, you know, I have to apply for another NIH grant. Can you give me some advice? Um, you know, they're never going to give me a second NIH grant. And, uh, and he said to me that the one thing that he the, the best advice he could give and the thing that he followed himself was you figure out what kind of science you really, really, really want to do and then, and then you apply for it. You describe it, you apply for it. And if it, it doesn't get funded, you, you don't change your area. You stick to the same area and you say, well, I must not have explained it to them right. And you keep persisting. He said, if you can't persuade those people, then you look for other grant, um, agencies. But remember to always work on the, the, the science that you really, really want, are excited about and want to do. And uh, that actually has been incredibly 
powerful advice for me over the years and advice I give to other people. That's, it is great advice. And um, the other is uh, the question of continually, uh, not necessarily repackaging, but basically to address those, um, uh, those weaknesses that might have been pointed out and go back again. Right, absolutely. And somehow are there people, young people seem to think that the members of review panels are super wise and, but you know, they're just like all of us. If you don't, if you don't explain it clearly enough, they may not have gotten it. So don't think that, you know, don't think that you were, um, there was something wrong with, with your idea. Uh, you know, you just need to try and explain it better, think clearly, address whatever they said, um, and be persistent, um, politely persistent. <laughs> okay. Over the last um, three decades, mm -hmm. we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of women in science, number of faculty, we still have a very, very long way to go. Uh, describe to us a little bit about your own situation from that standpoint, mm -hmm. and uh, what advice would you have today for young women uh, going into science and going into academic science, mm -hmm. and how to balance the demands of uh, research life and a faculty life mm -hmm. uh, and the personal lives. Mm -hmm. um, well, it is very different. I'm so glad it's different now. And actually, I'm very proud to be at the UCLA Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, where um, we have a large number of women. And I was actually the first tenured or tenured track woman on that, in the chemistry department there. Um, I was also the first uh, chemistry PhD from Princeton who was a woman. Um, so it was pretty lonely back in the beginning days. And in inorganic chemistry, I would go to, I went to an inorganic Gordon conference where I was one of two women. And they put us in the infirmary, so, <laughs> right, because they, they didn't have mixed gender <laughs> dormitories. Um, it's uh, um, it's a lot better now, but it um, it still depends a, a lot on um, where you go to school, where you get a job, um, and so on. And and I think that um, the most important advice I can give is um, to young women, well, or actually to young men also, is to be very cautious about um, where you want to work, who you want to work for um, when you're a graduate student or a postdoc, and, um, and, where, and where you want to work when you start to interview and get job offers. Um, you want to be someplace where you like the people and feel comfortable and feel respected. And I think this, I can't emphasize this too much, you know, even if it's you know, the, the place that you always dreamed of, when you visit, if you don't get the right feeling about it, be cautious. Um, and, uh, um, and then, you know, and then go for the opportunities when they present themselves and, and uh, good luck. <laughs> How about the, the question of juggling all of mm -hmm. your demands. We all are jugglers because mm -hmm. we have many right. things to do. Uh, and in many ways, I think women have, have it more, uh, it's tougher. And I would like to, uh, you know, try to have that ease so that uh, we can have gender equal juggling. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but in any case, what would you say to, um, young women who also think about, you know, their own, the family, mm -hmm. uh, personal mm -hmm. lives as mm -hmm. well as their academic lives? Well, one thing yeah. I would say is yeah. think carefully about whom you marry. <laughs> but sometimes people don't think of things like that. Um, no, but seriously, the, um, the um, actually the demands on young couples these days 
it's both the, men, the young men and the young women. Um, if, if a couple decides to have, if they have a dual career and they, and they have young children, it's a burden on, on both of them. Um, and uh, I, I, th I, actually I was asked by um, someone in my lab recently, you know, when is the best time to have children? And uh, I said, uh, there is no best time to have children, but if, you, if that's what you want to do, you need to do it, and you just figure it out along the way. Um, some children are real easy to take care of, and some children are very demanding. And, um, but um, you want to pay careful attention to how long your commute is and what kind of child care you have and, and play it by ear. Um, but it's very doable. There are lots of people now who've, um, oh, it's also important to have a supportive department, which UCLA has, and actually a growing number of departments are, um, are really, um, giving, it's not just time off to tenure, but really being supportive of young men and women um, when, they, when their children are born to be sure that, that um, they're not overburdened in those very hectic months and so on. Which is again why I really urge people to think carefully about where you end up working. Okay. How, how large a group uh, do you have uh, how um, and over the years, how how many mm -hmm. PhD students mm -hmm. or postdocs have come through your lab? Um, you know something I didn't. I I was going to <laughs> to figure that out. Um, I do have uh, I have a lot of um, PhD students. I've had fewer postdocs. I really enjoy working with graduate students. Um, the postdoc who have worked with uh, in my lab, um, actually some of them have ended up being senior research staff for a number of years before they went on to um, other jobs and they've been wonderful. Um, but I've really focused mostly on graduate students and, uh, and also undergraduates, research undergraduates, um, which I've enjoyed very much. Um, and uh, in terms of size of group, the group I mean, at Rutgers, I don't know, it started out small and it kept getting bigger and bigger. And when I went, moved to UCLA in 1980, a number of students um, actually came with me. Um, and then I built up the group again. Um, I mean, people added to that at UCLA. And um, uh, now it's a little smaller than it was at the height, but you know, 20 people, now it's, now it's smaller. Um, just whatever happens to be. What, what advice would you have in terms of um, how to run a group, uh, in, in terms of how we, uh, uh, we interact with all of our students and uh, uh, keep everybody uh, moving forward in the most positive way. Um, so my advice is is to really pay attention to what gives you yourself the most pleasure in terms of the level of involvement of your own personal involvement in the research. So when my group has gotten large, we were still very very productive, but. I started running out of time to spend enough time with people, really going over data, and, and I'm, re I'm really literally talking for my own personal pleasure. Um, you know, when I, when I <laughs> look at visible absorption spectra of some metal-containing species, I get a lot of pleasure from that. And, um, uh, you know, if the group's too big, I don't. Um, but there, I know other people who, um, you know, can get great pleasure and seem to be able to keep in touch with a whole lot of, a, a very large group. So I think it depends on the individual. But one of the things that's very important is that, is that each student or postdoc or undergraduate get, um, 
atten the attention, the mentoring attention that they need, either from the advisor or from somebody else in the laboratory. Um, and uh, I think it would, it's very much too bad when a group gets so big that some people get lost in it. And uh, I don't think that's been our, the case in our lab ever. Good. Let me turn attention to publishing. We've mm -hmm. both been involved mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. publishing or publications. Uh, you are a very successful editor of a very successful mm -hmm. journal. The Council of Chemical Research has really set the standard in terms of a, an article type, the account, the perspective from a person's laboratory, uh, and uh, in terms of a specific subject, um, has one of the highest impact factors <laughs> in, in chemistry. Everybody wants to write an account. Uh, Tell me about the challenges and enjoyment you have mm -hmm. uh, in editing. Uh, so, well, I do enjoy, I very much enjoy um, editing accounts. Um, but I, I need to make clear that I did not invent the format of the account. That was Joe Bennett. And really, when Joe Bennett, the first editor of Accounts for Chemical Research, when he started the journal, Nobody, this was a really totally new format, and uh, so he was really a pioneer, and it, it's turned out to be very successful. Um, I personally um, really enjoy mm. editing it because um, I work with a small number of senior editors, and we read the paper, we read the papers. Um, the, um, the volume of papers is not so high that, um, that that we don't have, I'm, the volume of papers is not high. We get a chance to read, uh, to read them and to work with the authors in improving um, the, the accessibility for the non-specialist reader. And that was something that Joe Bennett started and has persisted. Um, we really tried to um, help the authors write a review that, um, that graduate students will be, will be approachable to graduate students and um, to people who are not in the immediate field. Uh, so uh, yeah, no, I enjoy it a lot. I also enjoy very much um, work, working with our designer, Amy Pfeiffer, on the, on the covers. That's a, my own <laughs> a, a personal pleasure in, in doing that. So um, yeah, it's fun. Uh, the thematic issues that accounts mm -hmm. has is not something that uh, was always there. Uh, I think this is something that has been uh, more recent uh, meaning since you took edit editorship. No, actually, I I actually don't know if um, Joe had if Joe Bennett had special issues, but Fred McClafferty did. Okay, and so. Um, Oh, I think we've had more than previous editors, um, and uh, um, that is that's really fun because um, one of the things we're trying to do is to identify um, exciting new areas, maybe get there ahead of other people, and ask people to um, accounts is mostly by invitation. We we invite um, our most of our authors um, and. Uh, you know, to have special issues get there um, early and put together something that people will be interested in in, in a new field or a excite, particularly exciting field. Before you did your uh, work as editor-in-chief of accounts, you were an associate editor for inorganic chemistry. I think many of our viewers don't, <laughs> don't know that or appreciate that. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, I th you did it for more than five years, uh, uh, and uh, in part uh, with Fred Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your experiences with inorganic chemistry at that time. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Fred, Fred Hawthorne was really, he's a colleague of mine at UCLA and really um, a mentor to me. And uh, I was stunned when he asked me to be, um, 
an associate editor of Inorganic Chemistry because I was so enormously flattered. I had no idea if I would be good at or would enjoy editorial work. Um, but I was very flattered and so I said yes and then found that I really did enjoy it very much and that uh, working with Fred and Herb was, Herb Case was very enjoyable um, and, and the other <laughs> associate editors. Um, I was specifically asked to, um, to increase the profile of bioinorganic chemistry and, um, and so that, that, was, that was an exciting time with bioinorganic really growing then and inorganic chemistry as a, as a journal, the, a ma you know, the major journal in inorganic chemistry was paying serious attention to the growth of this exciting new area. So um, I really enjoyed it a lot and uh, would have stayed on doing it if I hadn't been asked to take accounts. What are the particular challenges that you see for, um, for authors researchers who write papers in areas like, in or, uh, like bio and organic chemistry uh, and to whom should they address their papers and where should they publish them and uh, why from one standpoint inorganic chemistry is an extraordinarily powerful journal to publish in and where from a different point they may be looking to the people who read biochemistry or even medicinal chemistry mm -hmm. journals, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think things have changed in recent years in a good way because um, if you put the right words in your title and abstract, um, a much broader range of people will, will pick up your paper, um, even if they don't normally read in a specific field. So um, it's very, very important that you, um, if you're working in a biologically relevant area, um, but you have a very inorganic um, paper that you feel, you know, that, that's your really desired audience, but you want the biological people to be aware of it also. Um, with the proper words in the title and the abstract, often people, I at least, read papers based on very broad searches and keywords. And I get papers from, I read papers from over a huge range of journals, but um, just using those search services. And so I think things are getting better in that respect. Where would you find the keywords or the particular uh, vocabulary to use for uh, uh, wider attention? <laughs> well, for in the beginning when I was um, publishing on um, superoxide dismutase relevant to ALS, I really, it was really a challenge because we were doing some inorganic spectroscopy with these um, mutant proteins and so on. and. I mean, it really belonged in the inorganic literature, or at least the chemical literature, um, and and yet I felt it was really relevant to the biomedical people. So I would have to put, um, you know, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis in the title or whatever, um, and uh, um, and then people were reading it. So you know, you really have to have to be. Have, yeah, you need to be sure that you think about the broader audience when you write your uh, title and abstract. How do you think uh, communication of uh, research results will change in the next uh, decade or so? Uh, we will have journals, but they'll probably be paperless journals. Mm -hmm. And um, have you? Um, given thought to, uh, actually I know you've given thought <laughs> to, uh, uh, how, how will scientific information be communicated in the future? Well, I can't see the future with any certainty. Um, I do hope very much that we retain the peer review system um, that we have um, 
I mean, when I see, when I find in my searches a paper from inorganic chemistry, I, all, I know the high level of reviewing that it's been through. This is incredibly important to me. It's a validation. Um, I hope we're not going to get to a, a place where we just all publish blogs. Um, but that being said, um, I think the paperless world is, it's really exciting. I think that um, this ability to search across broad ranges and read over many, many um, different areas. I mean, the, the papers to read are, are brought to you um, by, you know, Google, Google Scholar, Medline, Web of Science, et cetera. And, uh, um, and I also think you can even browse that way. You just sort of keep changing <laughs> keywords and see what pops up. Um, so I, I think it's very exciting. I think, it, um, I think it's getting easier to see what things are, are, are sort of related and they're not to avoid having tunnel vision. I know other people say, oh, we're only going to read papers in, their own, in our own specialty. But I don't find that's true of me at all. I find that um, I start reading all kinds of things um, because of my searches. I, I tend to think you're right on that. <laughs> um, I think one of the big challenges for us is, is uh, with all the information we get, how do we keep it organized? <laughs> and uh, that's one place where, where I, I think I'd like to see um, developments so that uh, one can pull PDFs or whatever form, mm -hmm. papers into one's library, have it searchable within one's mm -hmm. library, have mm -hmm. the references come out just uh, mm -hmm. perfectly. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. That's, uh, well, one of the things that's important is to remember s successful search strategies because you can, um, I mean, if, I've, if I have a combination of keywords that, that you know, give me really valuable papers in a field, I don't necessarily have to keep that search because I can reproduce it um, if I remember the search strategy. So yeah, it's a whole different way of thinking than we were brought up on. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But I think you're, you're more proficient than some of the <laughs> other people that uh, are, uh, uh, let's say, in our, our category uh, uh, age-wise with regard to uh, uh, you know, reading the journals and searching and, and well, uh, computer computers are my hobby. So that's electronic that's gadgets that's are my hobby. <laughs> that's great. In any case, with that, let me thank Joan Valentine, and uh, also say to you that I hope you've enjoyed this interview uh, and had a chance to really uh, take in what one of our real leaders uh, has to say uh, about uh, science, communication, publishing. Joan, it's been a real pleasure. Thank, Thank you, Rich. I've enjoyed it. <laughs>